please welcome Michael Moss, John Entine, Daniel Lebetsky, and Kathleen Merrigan. Thank you. Like Kim said, I'm back. And I wasn't supposed to tell you this till afterward, but I'm going to tell you now. There's a break after this session. So don't go anywhere, because I have this in my hand. You know what that means. The Prezi is back. But this is a short one. We're just going to queue up this fantastic panel that we have. Um, I left off uh, telling you about the 1999 uh, secret meeting of the CEOs where they said, are you out of your minds? We're not going to mess with the company jewels. Well, the guy who stood up in front of them and showed them this slide was a senior executive of Kraft. And he said, I'm not going to take that. And he goes back to Kraft, and he convinces the CEOs of Kraft, there were two at the time, to take a unilateral anti-obesity program. And they did sort of three amazing things. One, they, and this is so now, 2001, 2002, they decided their advertising to kids on Saturday morning was horrible, and they cut back on ads for their, for their most sugary products. Two, they told their scientists, thou shall not, no longer add, dump as much as salt, sugar, fat in your products as you simply want to, to maximize the lure. We're going to put caps on every ingredient. And then they go to the FDA, oh, sorry, yeah, F craft. Then they go to the FDA and they say, we've been less than perfectly honest with our consumers because we have a bunch of products that actually have multiple servings in them, but we've done some of our own research, right? And we're finding that a good number of our customers are eating the whole bag or drinking the whole bottle in one serving, right? And they, so they go like, so, and here's a survey we did. We asked them, and this is the number, actually. So in, in up to more than 40% of people were downing the whole thing. And yet, they're reading the little fine print on the label, which is what we're talking about here. And they're saying, well, it's 100 calories. And they're not calculating that they've, in fact, eaten 400 calories or drank 400 calories. They're thinking 100. So they're misleading themselves. And Kraft says, we've got to do something about this. We propose that we do the math for people so they don't have to do the arithmetic. And so they said to the, the FDA, going to do that, do the math for consumers. And they came up with this notion of dual labeling. It looks a little crowded back there, I have to say. But if you were keen on seeing what was inside, inside the entire package, Kraft was out there sort of doing that for you. But here's what happened. One of them got this bright idea that the most powerful part of the package is not the little tiny fine print thing you find on the back. It's the front of the label that you see when you're shopping. And so he goes, well, why don't we put like a big sticker on the front with the total number of calories in the package? And the Nabisco people, especially in the cookie aisle, fighting a big war, said to them, are you out of your minds? I mean, that's what most people look at. And then they decide to buy, and they don't look at the fine print. So they didn't go that far. But Kraft made a noble effort to sort of start wrestling with this question we're going to talk about, which is like, what do you put on the label? How do you be honest with consumers? What do you say to them? What maybe you don't you say to them? How do you be transparent, et cetera? And so let me introduce my three guests here, Kathleen Merrigan at the end, former US Deputy Secretary, Executive Director of Sustainability at George Washington University. And I'm not being unfair, because I'm asking everybody, your favorite candy junk, I'm sorry, your favorite junk was seasonally candy corn. So of course, I found some candy corn to look at. This is a wonderful one. You'll notice on the front of the label, made with real honey. Yeah, everybody excited? All right, let's turn it over. And the fine print, sugar, corn syrup, glaze, dextrose. Oh, there's the honey right before the color dies. All right. Hey, you know, front of the label, back of the label. John Entian is next to me, journalist, author, yay, journalist, fellow at the UC Davis World Center Institute of Food and Agricultural Literacy and a whole bunch of other stuff. Favorite junk food? You can tell me. 
Uh, McDonald's, sorry. Smoothies. <laughs> Smoothies. Yes. <laughs> so I didn't go to McDonald's, but I went online. That's a good looking one, right? What is that? That's the, uh, the blueberry pomegranate, right? Well, to their credit, if you dig into the website, boom, there you go. Uh, 340 calories, hey, that's not bad, but look at those carbohydrates, which translates into 70 grams of sugar at the bottom. Woo! All right. <laughs> Daniel Lubetsky is with us next, the founder and CEO of Kind. You all know the Kind bars and foods. Your favorite junk food, do you remember what you told me? Maybe dough donuts? Yeah, dough donuts from Brooklyn. Yeah. So, there they are. And everybody knows dough donuts don't have calories or fat or sugar, so of course I couldn't even find anything of that. Instead, what I found was this testimony on the website, and the favorite one of mine is, uh, this is the best donut in the world. I tried to eat it in teeny tiny bites, but my mouth kept opening wide. <laughs> Now, how would you like to have that on your labels, right? <laughs> that would be great. Um, so Kathleen, why don't we start with you? You've got a couple of big issues to raise. One thing you mentioned to me was the recent hot battle over the Dietary Guideline Advisory Panel, which is this group of experts that kind of wrestles with things like how much salt, sugar, fat, are good for us, what should we be advising the public out there about what to eat? And I know there's something on it. Tell us what you're thinking about in terms of that recent battle and that, that panel and their effect on what companies do or don't put on their labels and how we read them. Lots of stuff there. Yeah. <laughs> Big third rail issue this season for some reason politically. Yeah. Uh, my um, two colleagues of mine at George Washington University and three colleagues at Tufts <laughs> University uh, published an article in Science Magazine October 9th, so very recently, yeah. uh, talking about this issue. And interestingly, the first draft that we sent to the editors of Science was really about why sustainability should be a part of the dietary guidelines for Americans. And the response from Science was, come on, our readers know this already. Can you please unpack the politics? So let me stop for a second. So the first, for the very first time, this advisory panel decided to consider meat, right? Not in terms of nutrition per se, but in terms of its, its, its role in the world and ecology and sustainability and all of that. So looking at these fine nutrition guidelines in, in a broader context. Right, okay. so the Dietary Guidelines Advisory Committee that right. makes recommendations to the secretaries of right. Agriculture and Health and Human Service, and they make the final decision at the end of this year, right. uh, they advise that we should consider sustainability among the criteria and advising Americans how to eat. Right. A lot of the debate has focused on meat. We saw my plate, choosemyplate.gov earlier today, the, right. the plate um, food icon that came out of the 2010 dietary guidelines where half of your plate is fruits and vegetables. That's the dietary recommendation. What this advisory committee did, which has become so wildly controversial, was really just add the additional rationale. What's good for your health is also good for the planet. Mm -hmm. And it actually extends beyond me. And in our article in Science, we just give one, one example, and that is almonds, which um, I love almonds. They're heart healthy. And almonds, it's a complex issue. And almonds are doing a lot of great things out in California, where 80% of our almonds come from in the world, to conserve water and do things. But you know, it takes 2.8 liters of water to produce one almond. So when we think about sustainability across all the different foods, it's unnerved the food industry for four reasons, we argue. One is um, there's a lot of concern about disparaging food, saying certain foods are bad, mm -hmm. and that if we start putting things into categories like that, it will follow with regulation, sort of the trans fat transparency mm -hmm. step was led, you know, followed by banning trans fats, mm -hmm. that sort of thinking. The second reason is that um, people are concerned that it will shake up the food group. So instead of talking about protein on the plate, like that food icon, it would be beef versus chicken versus fish, 
And then within fish, it will be halibut versus uh, trout versus swordfish. Mm. That concerns people. Mm -hmm. uh, third reason is we argue that it's brought together the health community and the sustainability community together, which is a powerful coalition for all kinds of policy endeavors mm -hmm. through this, this year's debate. And finally, we argue that it elevates, by, by call, calling certain foods sustainable, it elevates the issue of sustainability within government programs, and therefore, the government has to do more. So the National Organic Program, which I'm very close to and proud of the work that we've done at USDA, when Congress wrote the law for organic, it didn't say where in the big U.S. Department of Agriculture it would have to sit. Mm -hmm. And the department made the politically safe choice to make it a marketing program. Okay. Not a better for you program, a health program, a nutrition program, but a marketing program. So your bottom line on sustainability and the proposal was... Let's do it. Let's do it. Let's do it like the Brazilians have done it. Let's do it like it's done in the Netherlands and in Sweden. Okay. And it's, the okay. science is there. John is jumping out of his seat. No, I want to go for it. I just want to say that this is, I think, more complicated, perhaps, than, than um, I think you understand the complications, but there's a political context to this. Sustainability is a word that means nothing and everything. It's been around for 15 years. Um, it's interpreted differently. And I think you raise a very, very interesting um, problem when you talked about when the National Organic Program was started. It was started as a marketing program, correct. But it was done for one very good reason, because there is no scientific evidence that organic food is better for you, more nutritious for you, or even more sustainable for you. There's a lot of evidence um, that sustainability can be achieved through a lot of different methods. There's conventional agriculture and use of genetically modified foods that are in some cases much more sustainable than organic foods. So when you start introducing a term like sustainability and you have a very narrow group of people who are defining that, that adds a whole political dimension. If it's a broad debate about what is sustainability, then it's a wonderful debate to have. But if it's one driven by people who have a view, let's say that organic food is naturally more sustainable than conventional food, then I think you're really making this a very problematic, politicized situation. You guys have met so, before, so, I no, take it, right? No. Have it, but and I, this I is why I put to... Daniel in the middle, but please. I, I love it because I was very worried that everybody's going to fall asleep, but he's going to wake you guys up. <laughs> but I have, to, I have to address that because in 1990, I don't know if Senator Kerry is still here. I saw him wandering the floor. Oh, thank you, Senator. So in the 1990 Farm Bill, we had a debate on the Senate floor about what the definition of sustainable agriculture is. And I remember working with Senator Kerry on that. It was a roll call vote. The whole omnibus Farm Bill went, it passed the Senate on unanimous consent, but there was a roll call vote on the definition of sustainability. I know the definition, it's, it's, it's a very good definition. Um, I helped write that definition. It's been standing in law unchanged for 25 years. So this idea is we can't do this because we don't know what sustainability is. I don't buy it. Give me an example. Let's, I'll give you an example. What about no-till um, farming technique, which is something that organic farmers never use, rarely use no-till farming. We know that it's a much more sustainable practice. It's used generally by farmers who use genetically modified crops, and yet for some reason organic farming is romanticized as more sustainable. You have a concept, a definition for sustainability, but when you actually put it into practice and examine specific practices, I think you have to understand, it's, in my mind, it's a much more nuanced situation. You have to look at certain situations where certain practices are better and others in which other practices are better. But the idea that somehow organic farming, which I know you're an enthusiast uh, for and consult for the organic industry, but it is a very, very narrow definition of what sustainability actually is. Can I add one? Yes, please, Daniel. <laughs> um, I agree that almonds consume uh, a lot of water, but when you compare them to the consumption that it takes to get protein from meats, they're darlings. So I, that's the issue of relativity because on one side, yes, you need to come up with, with practical measures to control with the water drought. 85% of the world's almonds come from California. It's a major issue for us. We buy over 1% of the world's almonds. And, uh, and yet, when you really compare your options for how you're going to feed the world uh, sustainably into the future, plant-based proteins are far, far, far superior to animal-based protein. So I, I do think it's a complex issue. I'm, I'm actually in favor on sustainability in general, but I do think it's a very complex issue. And I think it brings back the conversation we were having earlier about the law of unintended consequences, because all of these 
legislation that we as small companies end up facing, we just discover so many ways in which what Congress intended ends up having the completely opposite impact. And I can give you a couple examples if you'd like. Please do, yes. Um, so, <laughs> you worried I'm going to battle you the uh, way no, you looked at it? It's actually more enjoyable when there is actually a debate. Yeah. But, uh, but I'll, I'll tell you a couple of things that we just encountered recently. You know, we kind was founded 10, 11 years ago. We've grown a lot, but we were only now learning a lot of the complexity of stuff that we thought that we understood. And um, a couple of things that I learned over the last couple of months is, for example, the way the government currently ranks protein, it penalizes protein, like protein from almonds and other tree nuts, vis-a-vis -vis protein from meat. And the reason for it is that they, our bodies don't produce nine essential amino acids that we need to put in our bodies for us to, to, to function well. And the World Health Organization, where they were thinking about that child that they're only going to get to help once with that protein pack, they needed to fit in those nine essential amino acids. But then we brought those regulations for the World Health Organization, which makes sense in developing countries, here to America. In America, we don't have that problem as a general thing that we're not eating enough protein. We're eating too much protein and from too many sources. And so, for example, almonds have seven or eight of the nine essential amino acids, but they don't have lysine. But lysine is found in milk, in cheese, in many, many, in meat, in many other ingredients. So the likelihood that you're not going to get lysine from your diet in America is zero. It's close to zero, unless you're having hunger issues, which we need to address separately. But for the vast majority of people that are able to feed themselves, you, you don't need to have a, this franken food in terms of the whole food. And what ends up happening when, when the FDA favors certain things like that is it creates perverse incentives for food manufacturers to try to supplement a product with that license so that it can get the 100% the score of protein. Or just one more example, uh, which we won't do because we really want to price the whole foods rather than the micronutrients. But when Europe says that by just monitoring the micronutrients, it creates other perverse incentives. For example, we just learned this in the last few months. Today, Fruit Loops qualifies, it can use the term healthy. Uh, Low-fat Pop-Tarts can use the term healthy. Some children's puddings can use the term healthy. Almonds, salmon, avocados cannot use the term healthy because the way they define the term healthy is by limiting the amount of fat. So never mind that in the column that I just shared here, imagine the column, uh, the almonds, the salmon, and the avocados, it's good types of fats. It's monounsaturated fats. It's polyunsaturated fats. All the evidence, all the studies are showing that there was a study in the Harvard School of Medicine that you eat, you live longer if you eat tree nuts. There's incredible amounts of evidence of the cardiovascular benefits of monounsaturated and polyunsaturated fats. But because we, rather than looking at the whole nutritionally dense food, we're trying to micromanage, we create an incentive for people to create franken food rather than to celebrate real food. And John, is, I mean, is that kind of your problem with sustainability is that the conversation will quickly get very stupid and, and, and <laughs> boneheaded and go the wrong direction? I mean, because why not have this conversation about sustainability? Oh, we, we no matter how you define it, it basically means what? Like cows and pigs and sheep and stuff that are raised, you know, or that are thought about in the context of their impact on the world. Oh, absolutely. World. Sustainability is the center of the debate. You're good with that. Though. Oh, totally supportive of that. So you're not good with... What I'm not good with is assuming that we have a clear definition of what sustainability is. I think it's a right. highly nuanced concept. Right. I think that there are many components that go into it. And I think, look, I'm probably a pariah to most people here because I actually believe that the industrial agricultural system offers many benefits um, along with organic and agroecological food systems. Right. But they don't all fit in all situations. We have a very affluent country. Right. Some people can't afford a $3.50 bar. Right. That's and we only have... at the airports. Okay, sorry. Right, much less <laughs> Costco. And, uh... <laughs> my, only, uh, my only opportunity to try it. Uh, but I saw one in the... In the thank you very much for putting in it in Walmart. Oh. Uh, 125 on special right now. That's pretty good. We, we, we have to consider how, how we're going to, 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 to feed a larger number of people. Right. And there are 
agricultural practices, industrial practices, that actually make a lot more sense. Look, organic agriculture, the USDA just came out with a survey of 370 um, crops and said that the um, lag in organic production is about 30 to 40 percent in terms of yield. Uh -huh. That's not a sustainable number when you're talking about a global food system. Right. It works for upstate New York, right. it works for suburban Chicago, it doesn't work for a global food system. We need a complex one that involves organic practices when they're important mm -hmm. and involves industrial agriculture to deal with certain needs. I just don't like this demonization mm -hmm. of conventional and GMO foods mm -hmm. and this kind of romanticization right. of agroecology right. and organic. Kathleen, before I move on, do you want to? I don't know where to begin, Michael. Go ahead. <laughs> what about? <laughs> By the way, we're taking questions. I am so done with this panel in 10 seconds. So. Get them going, right? We were talking before, Daniel. You've got the kind bar. What, what, is, what does labeling mean to you? I mean, what are you trying to convey to people with the front of your label, with the back of your label? What do you think is important? If you, if you could do anything you wanted with the label, what would you do? Show the product. Show the product. What's well, transparent? It's clear, right? You yeah, do that. Just transparency, and in our packaging, is. Transparency is probably the, uh, the value that we're most associated with, but it's not just because of the transparent wrapper. It's because we strive, and we're not perfect, but we strive to try to be transparent in how we do it. And I think the back of the label is important, and we're, that's an area where we're learning all these things, and where a lot of these discussions are centered. But the front of the label, which has a lot more freedom to operate, as long as you don't make nutrient claims, is an area where you can also make enormous amounts of abuses, and where I think there's the opportunity when you are transparent and honest to, to win over consumers. In our case, when we created Kind, because you could see the ingredients, we wanted to just be very transparent in, in how we explain them also. So our ingredients are pretty, uh, the, the names of our products are pretty boring. And it's very hard for our, a couple of my marketing team members are here. It's very hard when you're creating names to just hold back and not come up with a fun name like, you know, Chunky Monkey. Enamored chunk, well, Chunky Monkey is great. <laughs> we can't really mess with that. But, um, but, but it's much more fun to come up with a fun name like Black Forest Cake. But our product, which has dark chocolate cherries and cashews, is called Dark Chocolate Cherry Cashew. Uh, it's, it's, it's more boring, but I think it's part of that transparency conversation of trying to be more honest. It, it creates dangers because then people can copy cashew and make also a dark chocolate nuts and sea salt and a dark chocolate cherry cashews. It's part of our vulnerability, but it's also our strength that consumers know that we really strive very, very hard. The number one ingredient in our products and the number two ingredients will track very closely to the front of the label, unless it's a characterizing ingredient like maple or sea salt, which is in very, very small amount, but it really provides uh, uh, mm -hmm. a defining experience right. for the product. So it's, it's, it's the straight lines that we use as opposed to motion and, and think we avoid uh, um, icons or images of product because right. what we found in our is that the consumer doesn't trust that anymore because they're used to buying you know 20 years ago that TV dinner and then discovering it was pretty different from what they saw in the picture and I think consumers now are very trained to very suspect of, uh, of pictures or iconography so that's why we try to just celebrate the product. We also talk about added sugar in the new proposal to list those separately in the package. But I want to go to questions because um, we have three minutes. Yes, please. You in the in the red. Thank you. Uh, I wonder if anybody in this room knows uh, something about almonds in Italy. Uh, I just came back from Sicily. It's the it's sort of like the motherland of almond production. They're grown apparently with very little without irrigation uh -huh. and very little water. Sounds like is Israel's irrigation system, right? We need to know no, a lot about not, that. It's not the number one, 85% of the world's almonds come from California, which is a huge challenge for all of us in society. And it is something we should be thinking about and talking about because it's very serious. Because if the drought continues, the trees are getting desalinized, uh, getting salinized, and it can eventually kill those trees. And maybe eventually you can plant them, you know, once spread available, but it takes seven years to plant trees. So and almonds is just one example of all these other crops that if we continue with these issues, 
California is one of the breadbaskets of, of America, and the issues that we're going to face with climate change are very serious. Today, almonds are 85% from California, 7% from Australia, which is the second largest. Spain is the third largest. Italy is well below there. The Mediterranean climate, so Israel, Jordan, uh, um, Palestinian territories here, places like that, ideally have the right climate, but as you were hinting, there's, there's water challenges. I have to remember we're talking about labels. So, you, so with almonds, what would you put on the label? Like, warning, this could be dangerous to LA's health? No. No, no, no. And I want to underscore the point that, I mean, I use, I, I use the example of almonds because almonds are a great crop and they're a healthy crop. And I know that the California almond, almond growers, or else they don't, they don't say the, um, they don't say the L. Almond, almond, right? That's oh, what they say. They say we shake the L out, the hell out of them, or L. Anyhow, anyhow. So almonds are—they're um, doing a lot of great work there in terms of water. And in fact, a lot of where the almonds are grown, there used to be rice and cotton, which is a more intensive crop. My point in this is, is that these issues are inherently complex. They're, in Massachusetts vernacular, wicked important, and it's time we start dealing with them. One more question. You had your hand up before. Yes, please. Or maybe two. I've been around long enough to have heard about how we're going to run out of food any minute for the last 40 years. Um, we grow enough food right now for 10, 9 or 10 billion people. Make it a label question, though, if you can. I'm answering, oh, okay, I'm sorry. answering John's okay. comment that we have to have biotech and we have to have these high-tech things because it's ridiculous. We're not going to feed everybody. That's the myth. Well, it may be a myth, but no, no, no scientist and no policy person, either in the United States or, frankly, any major politician involved in the agricultural policy believes your point of view. In fact, there's some new books that just came out about this. One quick one, and then we're done. Yes, sir. So a point of clarification in terms of your statement, Mr. Entine, about there being no demonstrable um, advantages to organic. Um, I didn't say that there are no, I did not say that. Uh, I, I, I said that value, there are nuanced value. advantages to both nuanced. kinds. Um, what on a label would you, uh, yeah, nutritional, my apologies. What on a label would you uh, be able to um, say are the uh, advantages of GMO product in uh, as an ingredient in something? Well, first of all, I don't believe that uh, we should have mandatory labels. I think we should have uh, voluntary labels as um, we have now in the United States with a non-GMO project. And why? Why? Well, put it this way. I'll just give you an example. The New York Times, the Washington Post, Scientific American, the American Association for the Advancement of Science, the American Medical Association all have come out against mandatory labeling for a variety of reasons. One, because it's highly distortive of a specific kind of breeding process, which is genetic modification, which is frankly standard as part of all kinds of evolutionary development of food. So somehow teasing out a certain kind of process and labeling it is very, very deceptive. It also stigmatizes it. If you look at the labeling bills that have been proposed, like the one in Oregon, for instance, it does none of the labeling that, we, that exists anywhere else in the world. They wanted a label on the front of a package that essentially becomes a skull and crossbones. We already know what happens when we put a label like that on. We did it with irradiation. Uh, back in the um, early 60s, and people avoided something that's very, very health beneficial to the food system. So we know that stigmatization doesn't work. We also know that stigmatization hasn't worked in Europe, where it's reduced, um, uh, reduced access to, to a variety of products. So I oppose it because I think it's really detrimental to science, and we don't put science to a democratic vote, and I don't think there's a big clamoring for it either. That's a good answer. Last word, Kathleen. <laughs> Since it's a panel on labeling, I want to end with a mini story. When I was deputy secretary, I went to Utah to visit a small slaughter facility, and I found that they had meat that was coming from New Zealand, trim, that would be frozen, and it would be shipped across essentially the world, where it was thawed in Utah, and then it was mixed with locally produced beef, and at the end of the processing plant, it was labeled freshly ground. Now, if I'm a mom and I'm going to the store and I see that hamburger that's got that label, I probably don't think it was frozen meat trim from New Zealand. So there is a role for government in rationalizing labeling everything from A to Z. Great. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. I do like it. Like oh, coffee break is on. When you have a time, I want to.
was just curious. I, I, 